welcome to Maverick Dreamers and Thinkers. I'm Chloe Cho. In the first episode, I shared a personal story of how I awoke from a coma and suffered two back-to-back accidents in my teens. Given my traumatic experience, I've often reflected on how one's near-death encounters can really make or break a person. Today, I'd like to share the story of a successful global entrepreneur whose personal journey is filled with several near-death encounters as he is back in fighting form after yet another close brush with death. Take a listen. Meet Christopher Guy Harrison. He's often seen being interviewed about the latest trends in luxury decor, schmoozing Hollywood royalty on the red carpet, or jetting around the world to open a new showroom. Tall, blonde, and handsome, the 59-year-old multi-award-winning British furniture designer comes across as someone whose life has been as smooth sailing as his suave demeanor. Yet his personal tales tell a different story. Born and raised in the United Kingdom, few would expect that he actually came from a modest upbringing. He worked as a bartender, bouncer, builder, handyman, and held down a number of odd jobs before finding his calling in his 30s by chance when he began trading decorative mirrors in Spain. The stint took him halfway around the world to Indonesia, where he went on to build his own workshop 25 years ago and began producing his own namesake mirrors. That business has grown over the years to offer a full range of furnishings from upholstery, dining tables, chairs, bed frames, sofas to office furniture, as well as a complete lifestyle and luxury collection under the brand of CG, in short for Christopher Guy. As he recollects the many years of hard work, the self-made entrepreneur is nonchalant or ambivalent about his success. Uh, you know, things in one case, sera, sera, what will be, will be. And I look at things, I said, I think a lot of them, I mean, I mean, um, it's, it really was how one treats negative experiences in their life and uh, you turn it around into a positive. Um, so I, I, I think I was um, recall speaking to my stepmother recently and I was saying, look, I've been so lucky in my life and uh, you know, and this, that, and the other. And, the, and she says, well, depends how you look at life because you're an optimist. But if you're a pessimist and you always say, look at your life and say it's been a disaster. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of things how you approach it. And I um, always look at things in, from a positive light. And so there were experiences there. Like I said, I, I went through things which is, is not the normal routine of life. How one defines whether they've lived a fulfilling life is a matter of perspective. But one thing is clear, Chris's life has been anything but normal. His formal education stopped in his mid-teens after his mother walked out on his father and fell in love and married a man 13 years her junior. That meant that for an 80-year-old Chris, his stepfather was just 21 years old, an unconventional setup, especially in the late 1960s which probably helped shape his views on love, relationships, and the balance of power. I always remember my mother, and she always said she didn't want to live beyond 50. I don't know why. She died at 47 of cancer. And and that was what she said, you know, um, she, I mean, I think she was always fearful of getting old. Her husband was, uh, my stepfather actually, he was, some 13 years younger than she was. They'd been married for 17 years. Um, I'd seen the um, the pain that she had gone when she had thought that um, he, she thought he, he was having an affair uh, with his secretary. And so, you know, you look at power. Now, where does power lie? You know, when we look at power, you know, in terms of, you know, you have wealth, you have beauty. You know, um, businessman goes out with a beautiful girl. You know, it's uh, so. Oh, she's only going out with him because he's wealthy. Yeah. Well, he's only going out with her because she's beautiful. You know, just like a, <laughs> <laughs> so, a nice yeah. little trade-off. <laughs> it is to say a trade-off, and it's something that's worked for thousands Centuries. of years. <laughs> yeah. 
As clearly as the lines are defined in his mind on how the balance of power works in society, it is no surprise that with the increase in his wealth and success, he's had his fair share of girlfriends and more. What I also find interesting about you is that you have so many ex-girlfriends um, in your entire ecosystem, some of whom remain close friends, some of whom have become sort of like semi-sisters, some of whom even work for you. And the beauty is that everybody gets along, at least, well, most that I, yeah. I'm aware of. How do you keep that whole thing together? Only because, you know, there's two different sides of a relationship, you know, um, you have uh, someone because you find them interesting, you have a friendship side of that, then you have an emotional side. Um, if the emotional side doesn't work, you say, well, look, oh, this is not working for me. <laughs> okay. But it doesn't mean that the friendship side, that you don't value those things of what you valued as friendship in the start. So it's you, you switch off from or what anything was on the emotional side, but you, you very much appreciate the friendships that you had because there's always a genuineness there. And I think a lot of times, you know, it's like friendships, you have to know someone inside out before you can really you know, you can confide in them. Whether in relationships or in business, the element of luck has served him well, as evident in his frequent use of the word luck when he speaks. Luck was certainly on his side on one occasion when he was behind the wheel and speeding. I think I really recall turning over a car, this is about 20, no, maybe 30 years ago now, and uh, going too fast, there's no way. And I was in a, in a countryside near Ringwood in Dorset. And I managed to turn the car over late at night just by speeding. And I remember the very first car that stopped was a nurse. <laughs> 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 and luckily, I, I really did turn the car over. I, mean, I was very lucky never to hit a tree. Lady Luck was also at his side around the year 2000 when he was supposed to fall under the spell of black magic but had to take an unplanned trip to Spain while living in Indonesia, a last-minute decision that saved his life. When you were living in Indonesia, getting your business off the ground and um, you had two maids, one of whom fell in love with you and she poisoned you, right? It's <laughs> a way of showing love, I guess, you know. <laughs> Black <laughs> magic. For maybe uh, by that period, maybe 10 years. And um, I uh, had left Indonesia to go back to Spain. And when I arrived in Spain, I suddenly fell very ill. And I went to one to hospital and another hospital and they couldn't figure out what it was, but I was... And a very high temperature. Um, I was uh, I was discharging uh, you know water the the color of Coca Cola, um, and uh, I was sweating profusely. And I was just getting I was just see I was going down down down. And I wondered what on earth that was. And uh, finally, um, I went up to uh, you know um, a hospital that specialized in tropical illnesses, and they said, well, what you have is you have typhus. So typhus, you know, so, and, um, which, um, uh, well, after about a week of treatment, I was, you know, full, you know, I had fully recovered. But the, what I discovered from that is how could I get typhus uh, from a place which no one ever knew anyone would get typhus. But what had happened, um, my, uh, my team back in uh, Java, <laughs> they were informed by the other maid that uh, the, um, the maid had gone to see the local witch doctor <laughs> in Indonesia and said, look, I want my boss to fall in love with me and uh, the, the and uh, by that, how can I give him something that will, then I have to take care of him and I'll make him well and he'll fall in love with me. So apparently the, the, the witch doctor had given her a, a little like a plastic bag, which they, they used to you know, serve like um, uh, soft drinks in Indonesia you know, with a straw but anyway, he gave this uh, that which was obviously from I don't know, sewage water, whatever he could, what it was mixed up with. But that was what she had mixed in with my drink or food, and uh, probably sewage water yeah. or something. <laughs> which yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that was another experience. Unafraid to tempt fate, 
One early morning in May 2010, Chris took his Lamborghini GTR for a 350-kilometer drive from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, with a group of friends who also owned supercars. They left Singapore at 4 o'clock in the morning, and on their way back, they were just about 20 kilometers away from the border in Johor, Malaysia, when Chris's GTR hit an uneven bump on the outermost lane of a three-lane highway, which was being repaired, sending the car airborne in a somersault before it missed trees and landed in a green verge upside down. Within minutes, the Lamborghini blew up in a fireball. Chris survived, albeit heavily injured. Perhaps third time lucky? Uh, it was over 200 miles an hour, crashed down, something like 330 kilometers an hour, which was something which was um, really totally unsurvivable. Um, and that was really you know, like a cannonball run with, uh, in that day, was with a GTR, which is uh, another very fast car. I was driving my Lamborghini. And uh, so when you're getting high speed, you need downforce. And if you don't have the downforce and you uh, go over a, an uneven bump, well, that sends you airborne, which is what happened to me. Were you drunk in any of the two drunk. incidences? Never, no. This was 11. The, um, the, um, the one with the Lamborghini was at 11, the, uh, 11 a.m. in the morning. So we'd already done about 300 very early. We had done, there's a, there's a lot of early morning drives and we took all these cars out and setting up at 4 a.m. in the morning. And this was on the return. And um, so it, when the, uh, it hit the um, a bump, sent the car airborne into the crash barrier, over the crash barrier, and then it somersaulted over 140 meters down a green verge, which was the only green verge in that area, um, and missed the trees, missed the signs and landed on its roof and came and, uh, and the fire started to, to come in. Um, we were on our roof um, and it was um, unconscious. So at that point, um, there's a friend who was driving the GTR. Uh, he had seen, he thought my car had blown, um, car tie had blown and he um, pulled to one side and uh, reversed back, called the other cars on the drive and they had stopped. He ran down, well, well to see where I was, and he, he could identify we were from smoke in a distance. So they ran down, and the first uh, feeling this was no noise coming out of the car, that the car was about to blow up. So people were taking, uh, um, standing away from it. Um, I, I had, my, my girlfriend at the time was next to me. We were inside. The you guys were inside the car. Yeah, to go. Of this car that was about to blow she up. She regained conscious. Time she regained, and um, she was able to. We were both upside down. She was um, able to undo my safety belt. I couldn't see because all my face was bloodied and had a had a little broken bones in my face and my arms and so. And, and miraculously, she didn't have any broken. She didn't have any blood on her, despite the huge impact that we had. And it was a result that she had done my safety belt. The guys who heard, heard, heard her voice came down and um, they the, the little side uh, and window from the Lamborghini. We were able to be, I was able to be pulled out first because without me being pulled out, she could have not been pulled out. So we came out, both of us pulled out, I couldn't, I was still uh, semi-conscious, came out and uh, I remember falling on the floor, and the very first thing I asked my uh, friend Rohit, I said, Rohit, mate, how is Sonia? How is Sonia? And he said, he, he's, uh, she's okay, mate. She's okay, mate. And I could see, he feel the heat coming from the, the burning car, at which time that had all gone up in smoke. Um, so there was nothing left of the car. It was, uh, was beyond, was, well, it was, it was probably the most unsurvivable accident that anyone could ever wish to have. I remember um, the ambulances arriving, which were local ambulances from Malaysia, and took us down to a jaw. And um, it's funny things how you you recall certain things. And I remember that the first pain I felt was actually actually on the table. 
there was an x-ray plate that had, been, that had forgotten to be removed from underneath me. And I was in agony. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> was he saying? Whoa. And I was like, so, so, so I just pointed at the plate underneath me. I was digging into my metal plate in my back. So that was actually the first sense of pain I had. Then uh, the, I already recall is that was the interesting things of what comes to mind. A friend of mine, um, uh, the, the Rohit, who actually was in the other car, and he's been a very good, who actually saved my life um, in this accident. Um, and the uh, the doctor, I could hear the doctor said, oh, "Do you know how old he is?" And uh, Rohit said, "I'm not too sure. I think he's 52 or 53." And I replied, "No, I'm not. I'm 49." <laughs> 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 so one of the things that you you look at is says, you know, you imagine that you think first things that comes to mind is that you can imagine your tombstone with the wrong date on there. It's really <laughs> silly little things like that. Were you in a coma, induced coma, uh, brain well, concussion? I, I was pretty. I was uh, semi-conscious. I couldn't see, but I had because on my forehead, my nose had been pushed into my my my, my forehead, my my forehead. Was all uh, broken, so they had to. Um, uh, I still got my big bam, lump on bump on my head. Also, so, so, I don't know what, how it what I hit, um, and then um, I had broken ribs and uh, uh, my arm was broken. But I I didn't, you know. I just went in and uh, came out, and suddenly, uh, when you you pop out, you you find yourself in the um, you know just laying in a bed and uh, thinking, well, what happened? But the thing that really uh, suffered from that wasn't the accident, it was the fact that I'd almost killed Sonia. The guilt place. trip, especially after you had both broken up the night before. Uh, completely. Um, we actually we had, we, this was actually, we had got back together. That was what had happened. You know, I just remember looking at in my, um, in the hospital, I remember looking at the window and I think, God, if anything had happened to Sonia, I would jump out the window. I would never, ever wanted to survive. I would have killed myself for sure just from pure guilt and as you know it was um i i used to remember getting into the shower every single day and uh, um and i would uh, burst into tears because i just thought well you imagine what how this would have you know what would have you know how uh this has affected her parents her family uh her life and miraculously i mean if when anyone's seeing the state of the car there was an engine block at the end of it and that was it but to see that Sonia didn't come out with, she didn't have a, a, a drop of blood. Just a few bru- bruises. She had bruises. She had a, um, a hairline crack on her, on her, on her, um, on her um, hip, and that was it. That's what she did. Um, but it was just, it was just um, because the car flipped from tip to toe, tip to toe, tip to toe, tip to toe, all the way down this grass verge and came on, landed on its roof. Sounds like a mild concussion, so they didn't have to open up your head, your skull. No. It was no. more like a facial impact. It's facial. Yeah. And so it's you facial. had to have and, um, yeah. reconstructive yeah. uh, surgery, right. plastic put surgery. That's right, in my, my, um, my forehead. Yeah, so I also could feel my screws there still. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> still there. Put my nose back into shape. Uh, my, my teeth had gone through my lips, I broke some of my teeth. Um, and um, then the ribs, um, well, they just they heal by themselves. He and his then girlfriend Sonia recovered together for about two months as they tried to get back on their feet. Despite their ordeal together, their relationship wasn't to be, according to Chris, so they went their separate ways. They're still in touch till this day, and they celebrate the 16th of May by sending each other messages to mark their miracle of surviving that horrific accident together. In 2018, Chris had a strange premonition while watching scenes of Freddie Mercury falling ill in the movie Bohemian Rhapsody at a theater in Los Angeles, where he had newly settled to accommodate his growing business in North America. I had actually gone to, I just get full body scan checkups. Um, my doctor had said that they saw like a little nodule on my, uh, on my left lung and maybe it's nothing. It could have been a result from my broken ribs and that I had in the accident. Um, but they could do a biopsy um, um, if I wished. 
Um, but I was just traveling and I actually even forgot about even getting a follow up. I noticed I was coughing a little bit and um, I'm a non-smoker by the way. And then I remember we went to see the film Bohemian Rhapsody uh, when it was launched in, uh, I think it was October in uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2018. But I recall standing when we were going there, my, my bottom of my feet were killing me. It was, felt like someone had hit me with a baseball bat, you know, when they tie people up, <laughs> string them up by the feet and then hit them with a baseball bat. Well, that's what it felt like. Um, and um, so anyway, after that, um, I became a little bit, my coughing got a lot more extreme. I, I said to, um, uh, to my partner, Kisa, I said, Kisa, you know, I, I think this is something a little bit more, uh, I'd better get over to Singapore and check this out. We saw a uh, respiratory specialist uh, and they said well looking at what we think we think this is cancer let's get a biopsy on the Wednesday looked at it, the results and immediately they said well you better stage 4 uh, lung cancer and they sent off the results to the United States and uh, to see what kind of gene mutation I had and it was confirmed that mine was non suitable for any of the current Im immunotherapies so now this is November, mid-November. Then a decision comes to make and say, well, at any point did I go, oh my God, uh, why me? No, I never does. Well, I was 58 years old. So I've had a great life so far. You know, um, there's, um, I never fancy getting too old anyway. I thought, uh, you know, I enjoyed the, so I thought, well, look, if there's never a time, there's never a good time to go. You know, there's a, there's a saying in English that says, you know, um, a friend, in, uh, you know, a friend in need is a friend indeed. But there's another saying that says a friend in need can be a bloody nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> so, November, I knew the diagnosis. I didn't want to be a burden to anybody. Um, so I wasn't going to do chemotherapy. Is it possible to avoid chemo? Yeah. It's impossible to avoid it, but I knew I was going to die early. I remember when you told me that the doctors told you that you only had, I don't know, three to four months up to maybe a year, and you're still here. Well, what uh, happened? <laughs> it's so interesting, and this is where, okay, when it comes to these things and why I was not going to do anything and um, how um, some very good friends, you know, uh, Keith, um, Martha Gill, uh, who today is a fantastic friend, she had gone through breast cancer four years ago and I pushed her and they were going to get her treatment. It was very devastating when I heard about her getting breast cancer. She came over in turn and Kisa, they both basically, we went down to the oncologist for the five, fifth time, both as I'm not doing chemo and they both burst into tears. So you got to do, you got to do. I said, okay, I'll do chemo. <laughs> so I think we so got, buckled. <laughs> I buckled. <laughs> so it was uh, the 26th of December. To, um, we think the two days later, we went to see the oncologist. The very next day I, I had my first chemo. Um, and, and it was fine, you know. The chemo, what they had done, they had mixed it, my, um, mixed my, there was two um, yeah, different types of chemos, chemo, um, um, uh, uh, what do you call them, infusions, and they'd also mixed it with an immunotherapy, which even though I was not suited for immunotherapy, they wanted to try um, uh, uh, something which is called Keytruda. <coughs> hey. I recall, um, yeah, it was the first days was fine. Then, um, you know, I think the first three months were, you know, you, you know, actually, I, I recall that if I, before I started the treatment, I was going downhill very fast. So that no treatment was my time was very, very limited for sure. Even just over a very short period of time when the condition had appeared. Um, January, February, um, I, I was on the, still on the, going through maybe my third chemo mixture with Keytruda, um, um, mixed um, with them. Um, and I felt very, very ill and I was in tremendous pain at that point. Um, and, uh, they, um, they, uh, said, well, look, it looks like I was coughing so much. I was coughing up so much foam. And they came to the conclusion that it was as a result of the, um, that it was a result of the muscle spasms that I was having uh, from coughing so much. So they put me on steroids and um, increased my life in the hospital for five days and the steroids worked. I got up to six chemos and on the sixth chemo, 
Because when you're on the ex- intense chemo, they take it up to six. After that, there's what we call is maintenance, which is every three weeks. So my six chemo, um, they also um, they um, they pumped out my lungs, and um, so to see what the state of those is. So they took two liters of liquid out of my lungs. Uh, my lung, left lung, and um, and I remember seeing this big bag filled up with a bloodied, watery uh, mix, and um, they, um, next day they came back, and uh, well, I went to see the doctor and see what they found, and the doctor said, well, you know, unfortunately it, it's cancerous, the liquid, and we were hoping that it wasn't, and so there's really no point continuing with your, your chemotherapy. I, I think in all of these cases, I just accept my fate. And at that point, I said, okay, it's, I knew this was going to work you know, for any length of time. And I accepted it. What was concluded as ineffective based on the opinion of one oncologist was disputed by another cancer specialist and validated through tests. After seven rounds of chemo, It was three steps forward and two steps back in his battle to beat stage four lung cancer. But the lesson he's learned over the past year is that it's absolutely critical to seek as many opinions as possible. As much as he takes his battle with cancer in a business-like manner, he wants to settle his life on his own terms when the time comes. What also amazes me is how, uh, again, you have stage four can- lung cancer and somehow you're not broken. I've seen so many people who suffer from cancer. They go through one or two rounds of chemo and they are just completely emotionally, mentally, psychologically broken. How, how, do, how do you just um, bulldoze through uh, as if nothing had happened. Do you treat this as if you're running a business? You're very analytical. Okay, something is not working. Let's try this. Boom, this works. This doesn't work. What's next? Like I said, you, you come to a point in your life and you say, well, how much more life do you expect to get out of you? You've been lucky as you have been so far. And, you know, you, you know, is chemo, you know, there's, um, you yeah, know, it depends um you know, it's just, it wasn't a very appealing, it's one of the least appealing things I think any of the treatments anyone can wish to go through or not wish to go through. So, you know, you're left with that, that choice really. And now you can think, well, when I was going through my chemo, I thought, well, look, imagine all those poor people out in the world that don't have access to this. And yeah, I do. While he appears stoic with the challenges brought on by cancer, The illness has triggered a change of heart in the self-professed playboy or the unmarrying kind in his own words as he walked down the aisle for the first time just a year ago, a month after receiving the cancer diagnosis. There was no honeymoon. Two days after exchanging marriage vows, he was hospitalized to undergo his first round of chemotherapy. My wife is 28 years younger than I am, and um, really, has, she's kept me alive, no doubt about it, all this time, which has been fantastic. But I would always be very wary of being 70 or 80 years old and, and being with someone who's 28 years younger, which is the reason that I never got married when uh, when she was uh, when I knew she was pregnant, because I thought it would be unfair, it would be selfish of me to just to expect that. But the reasons. I did get, you know, get married was because it was really was for the well-being, um, you know, um, and I think, and she's been, like I said, it's been fabulous. But I think it's it's all about, it's not my own personal ego we or anything like that. It's just, uh, um, we, we gelled very well and I was very lucky. So I would say, so I come back to it, that was to me was being very lucky, but I'll be very, very aware. But I said, some people say to me, so why did you get married? I said, because I thought I was going to die. <laughs> you, know, you know, and that is, you know, so it's a silly way of looking at it, you know, but I did not mean that in a mean way or any way like that. Other than that, it would have been selfish of me believing that I was going to live a long time um, to to someone who's 
um, well, so much younger. But you know, luckily, my 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 wife, she's not a party goer. She's very just, down to earth. Is your cancer situation is that stable now with uh, immunotherapy? And chemotherapy having、uh, made some progress, do you see yourself, you know, celebrating your 70th and 80th birthday, 90 potentially 100? I just celebrated my 59th birthday, and I never thought I was going to get there. I think it comes through different beers. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, um, um, my cancer marker went down, and it's gone down. I think it's only about nine. Nine. That's almost.、Yeah. It's almost finished. <laughs> almost finished, but I, if you follow others who have those cancer markers, you know they they can go within a couple of days, go up into a thousand just like that. It's、um, it's so a cancer marker is only just a look. What we do now is like okay, so what do we know from lung cancer? Fourteen、um, percent survival rate, so it has a, one of the lowest survival rate amongst cancers. Um, those who do survive catch it at a very early stage, stage one,、um, where you can operate on it or you can do something then. So already I know that I'm at a very late stage on that, you know, with things. So, so did the immunotherapy help? I'm sure it did.、Um, I didn't recognize it at the time, but、uh, or,、um, or, or just you know, knowing, but at the same time, I know whether I was very ill at the same time. So immunotherapy is not this walk in the park. It's not magic. It's not like an aspirin. It does give、um, some serious、um, you know, down effects, and、um, uh, and then so you've got to measure that. So luckily, you know, I had gone through that. Being the boss of a global business, everything is about planning a five year, ten year. You know, do do you see that? A lot of what I do is actually、uh, is the planning. Now、um, I don't see myself on a frankly.、Um, I know your own body. I mean, it's not、um, you know. You, you, I, I still shortness of breath, and、uh, I know my lung capacity is down. And、uh, what happens is that the the it's the the inability to 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 plan.、Um, I you know I was intrigued to say what's going to happen with Brexit or with Brit. What's going to happen with Donald Trump? How are they going? What's What's you know? It's like you. It's like reading a book, but you 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 know you're not going to get to the end chapter to find out. Doesn't that annoy you? Yeah, it does. But that is the part that where your mindset starts changing. It's um, it's not that you you know you have forever and ever are men to go. You know you you know that you're limited. So everything becomes much shorter term planning. You know、um, you can't even think. Well, I'm going on holiday or. What do you do? You know, I don't buy clothes, for instance. Now I just said, why would I buy clothes? I wouldn't buy shoes. I'm in that stage where it's no longer about me. It's about those、um, who surround me, and how do I ensure their well-being? And I think it's kind of intriguing because you know when you come into the end of one's own book, you know you know how the story wrote and how the what was the ending like and. When you go through certain areas, whether it be the car accidents or the、um, you know the、uh, chemo, you you realize that these are、um, you know you are you at the end of a chapter or you are at the end of the book.、Um, the the car crash was the end of the chapter. I believe this what I have now is the end of the book. He's prepared to write the final chapter of his book and is set on doing it on his terms while making sure that his loved ones are looked after. He has two children: a seven-year-old boy from a previous relationship and a one-and-a-half-year-old boy with his wife Kisa. As a company, basically in Switzerland, euthanasia. I actually signed up for it. The reason I signed up for it was、um, that I had been、uh, my condition was、uh, said to be terminal. Um, and this is before I wanted to get into chemo, and was, even when I started chemo, so look, I have this.、Uh, a, you know, it's called Dignitas, actually in Switzerland. Dignitas is near Switzerland, and、uh, near Zurich. And so I thought, well, you know, yeah, do you want to be in control of this or don't you? Because when you were hearing about, you know,、uh, um, what is what do you have control at the end? You're lucky in life, or you're not so lucky in life, but. It'd be very unlucky in life if you, you know, you go、um, when you sign out. It's it's not how you sign in life. When when we sign into life, it's we're there. We suddenly pop out and <laughs> we're there. And things you know, you get to a kindergarten, it's all blues and bright colours. So when you look at like something like dignitas in Switzerland, 
He says, well, look, um, I can say my goodbyes and say this is it, you know, and um, and it becomes more of a um, you know, much more genuine, you know, and, um, and you're doing it under your own terms. Yeah, it's sort of like you can plan your life. You can plan your life. I mean, it's um, it's a um, it's a very different way. I mean, it's it's not so easy with dignitas because you I mean you have to keep um, you know, dating them every three months with your current result. Do you have religion? What keeps you? What is your wrong? No, I'm, I'm necessarily not religious. Um, I don't believe in a man-made religion because it's always tend to be manipulated by man. But if I look at life, what we have around us, I say, just an incredible what we have. I always felt that if there was a God and he saw what man can and had done to his Garden of Eden, I think if there was, <laughs> he gets to heaven, <laughs> the pearly gates, He's going to let the uh, the giraffes and the lions in, <laughs> the tigers in. But when the, the man comes knocking at Adam and Eve gets up to the door, he says, well, I'm not letting you into my heaven anymore. I'm not after what you've done to the planet Earth. So, I mean, I, I look at this. I'm, I'm, I just said, you have no reason, I have no knowledge of why I'm here, how I got here. But just be very, very grateful and, and respect that we are where we are. But I think this is ashes to ashes and um, after that. He may have made peace with whatever destiny has in store for him, but in the meantime, Chris is busily at work to execute his new vision, building a tech hub called Java Valley in Indonesia in partnership with famed British architect and friend Thomas Heatherwick while growing his luxury decor business CG. We're going to check in on Chris and pick up our conversation again sometime soon. We'll keep you posted. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Christopher Guy Harrison. We'll be most grateful if you could subscribe and share your feedback. Do make Maverick Dreamers and Thinkers a part of your weekly routine. And if you'd like to find out more about our podcast, go to www.brilliantmp.com for details. Until next time, to all the great dreamers out there, I'm Chloe Cho. Take care and stay tuned.